So we're going to talk about um, measurements and uh, different units that we use to, to um, kind of help us understand each other when we're talking about measurements. Numbers. Numbers in math, you know, in math, they'll do all sorts of cool math. Uh, 46 divided by 3.2, right? 22 times 18 divided by 7 plus 6, right? But they never really tell you 22 what or 18 what. Sometimes you get a word problem now and then, but in chemistry, every number has to have a unit of some sort uh, because um, your units, uh, I mean, every number that you have is the measurement of some sort, okay? So, you know, feet, meters, kilograms, um, uh, let's see, what else? Volumes, right? Meters cubed or milliliters. These different types of, of units are associated with every measurement that we have out there. And we can't perform the, the, the math problems in chemistry without them. These examples, well, I don't know if you remember this. In 1999, um, a NASA lost a, a Mars probe um, because they were using they were doing some collaboration with different countries and they were using the wrong units. Uh, so one agency thought that the other one was using certain units and the discrepancy resulted in that they weren't giving the probe enough power and it ran into the uh, into Mars and, and exploded. Do you remember that? Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Not terribly long ago, I guess, but now it's 21 years ago, so long enough. So, uh, another example that I kind of think of sometimes is somebody might say, I saw the biggest hot dog, or, you know, I try to explain, I saw something that was really big. It was 203.8. And uh, without units, then somebody else could hear the number and think, yeah, I know what you're talking about. I've seen it before. It's, it's really big. But the units help put us in the same uh, understanding, right? So we want to make sure that we always think about units. And units also allow us to know that we're doing the, the calculations correctly because we know what units we should be able to, we should be getting at the end. And just like the math numbers, the units get multiplied or added together as well. So, um, they do have a standard uh, set of, of uh, units for things like length, mass, temperature, time. And I think the long time ago, they kind of thought, oh, good, we'll standardize it and everybody will start using it. But it really never materialized that way. So we still teach and let people know that there is a standard out there. And I guess in some, I don't know what kind of a circumstance you would find yourself where you have to use SI units, but in general, um, we all are aware, and if we don't remember what the SI unit for some specific measurement, we can go look it up. So um, these are the units for the different quantities over here, and these are their symbols. We're not going to try to memorize this, but over time we'll get used to um, the ones that we need to get used to. The one that we could bring a little bit of attention to is temperature. Temperature, the common measure or the SI unit is Kelvin, even though we'll do some calculations in Celsius and we'll have a lot of conversations about degrees Celsius. Uh, we won't talk a lot about Fahrenheit because science really does relate more to, uh, you know, revolve. Its temperature conversations are usually in Celsius or Kelvin. And as I mentioned, uh, you can derive new units by multiplying, dividing, combining other units in some way. So, for example, uh, if I have a cube here, and the length of this cube here is one centimeter, the height is one centimeter, and the depth is one centimeter, then to find the 
volume of the cube, I would take 1 times 1 times 1, and the units would be, oops, centimeters cubed, right? Because I took the 1 centimeter, multiplied it by 1 centimeter times 1 centimeter, and so the answer is 1, but the units have to be multiplied by each other as well. And uh, it just so happens that one centimeter cubed is also an important value because it is uh, defined as one milliliter of material. So if you have a, a volume of water that's one centimeter cubed, it is also one milliliter of water. And it's amazing always when you go to the doctors, for me at least, you go to the doctors and they still use this term one cc, which means cubic centimeter. Um, I, I really haven't figured out why they still use that term um, as opposed to just one milliliter, one cc, but that is a term that they still use. cc standing again for cubic centimeters. All right, some other helpful tools that we have to help us talk about uh, values and numbers are these these multipliers or these prefixes that um, we're familiar with some of them but a good conversation about them never hurts so let's uh, what these are most useful for is when we're kind of verbally talking about something or trying to read through some information collect it quicker uh, right, because here's, here's an example of a conversation I had one day in grad school. At first, he said the particle was 0 0.00000001 meters long, so I was like, cool. Then he changed his mind and said it was 0 0.00000000001 meters long. Then I knew his data had problems, all right? So that's not going to be very impactful for, or understandable for people who listen to it. Um, because the zeros are just can't be collected effectively either uh, hearing it or reading it. So we use the prefixes to help us out. At first they said the particle was one nanometer long and then he changed his mind and said it was 0 0.01 nanometers long and I knew that that couldn't be the case. There's no way anything could be that small. So I couldn't trust the conversation, right? So anyways, one nanometer and 0 0.01 nanometers are values that I can compare really quickly. This one is uh, 100 times larger than this one. Okay, so let's see which of these prefixes we already have um, solidified in our brain, if any. Um, first of all, I think that we probably have heard of centa in terms of centimeters, right? Centimeters. Um, now, the prefix centa, century, uh, we call a penny a cent, right? We say what, what percentage of whatever, right? So centa is referring to 100. And what, what do we mean when we say centimeters? How does that 100 relate to meters? One meter is what? How many centimeters? Yeah, 100 centimeters. And, you know, a centimeter is about that big right there. One centimeter. All right. Um, and maybe you're already familiar with millimeters. One meter. Do you know how many millimeters there are in one meter? Thousand. Thousand. Very good. A thousand. And so the millimeter there is... Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Right, I tried to cut that up into ten. So, uh, one centimeter. How many millimeters? Oh, um, ten thousand. Oh no, just one centimeter. Right? No. Oh, I see. Uh, uh, one hundred. One centimeter. Right. This is one centimeter. There's just yeah. ten millimeters in that centimeter, 10 oh, centimeters. Gotcha. Gotcha. Getting a little small there, huh? Yeah, I'm sorry. That's fine. Yeah, so one centimeter is the same as 10 millimeters. 
So Senta and Mila are probably ones that we're most familiar with. And um, there's not a whole lot more that we really need to become familiar with. Um, it's helpful if we pick up micro. Uh, in this class, we won't spend a lot of time in nano, but micro and kilo we would like to become familiar with. I think the rest of them, you can always kind of Google and try to find out what they are. Um, but so we got centa, milla, micro, and milla is one thousandth of whatever it is. So if we're talking about millimeters, a thousand millimeters per meter. And micro, nano, and pico change uh, by three decimal points. So micro, there's a million, not a thousand, but a million, right? So let's write this out for ourselves. One uh, millimeter, oh, sorry. 1,000 millimeters in one meter. Um, for micrometers, there's 1 million micrometers for every one meter, right? So we added on three new zeros to go to micrometer. And when you go to nanometer, you add on an additional three zeros to get to a billion nanometers for every one meter. So these this N and M should be the same size there. And then pico is uh, three more, a trillion. Going the other way, if you get big, it's called a kilo. Uh, a kilometer, also known as a kilometer, is a thousand meters thousand meters in a kilometer. Now, um, oh, what was I going to say? A thousand key or a thousand meters in a, a kilometer, a kilometer. Um, oh, I had a way for us to remember that. What is, what am I thinking? Hmm. Kilometer. Oh, yeah. We need to make sure that we have the ability to think about our numbers in terms of uh, multiplication factors, or maybe you could think of it as scientific notation to a degree, where if you take uh, uh, a kilometer, a kilometer, right, there's 10 to the third meters for every kilometer. All right, uh, if I have one meter, how many micrometers are there? It's 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 6. And that's what this information in this far right column is showing us. So micro means 10 to the minus 6. There's 10 to the minus 6 uh, meters for every micrometer. Uh, kilo, there's 10 to the third meters for every kilometer, and so forth. Mega, giga, and tera, um, I usually remind people that file sizes on computers are often now in the, these ranges. Files are generally a couple megabytes, the smallest, um, hundreds of gigabytes for very long videos, right? And hard drives are now coming in about terabyte sizes, right? Or even more. Okay, so using this information, let's see if we can fill out this, uh, this chart right here. Okay, so we're going to try to fill out this chart. And um, we're going to fill in the missing information. Now I'm going to make this... A little bit, a little bit smaller, <clears throat> so that I'm right about there. Hopefully, it's not too small for you. Uh, but for example, we say that there's 10 to the minus nine grams for every nanogram, and then for a kilogram, what would we put in this box right here? 
10 to the what grams is a kilogram? A kilo is a thousand. Yep. So that means 10 to the what? What do you think? Uh, 10 to the, well, I wanted to say third. That's the, right. That's right. And that's, it's, that's pretty easy. If you can remember that a thousand has three zeros on it, zeros. then the, the, the exponent on the 10 will be the number of zeros, 10 to the third. Okay? Good. 10 to the third kilograms. Uh, what about, um, I guess this is what I really want to do. I want to take this one over here. What about the next one there? 10 to the minus 12. How many, or what can we call that? 10 to the minus 12 grams. What can we refer to that as? Uh, pico. Yeah, that's right. So a picogram is 10 to the minus 12 grams. Good. What about what's missing here in this area? Uh, the grams, right? Let's see. Well, uh, now we're in not NG, but N what? What's it say? Can you read that? Well, meters. Yeah, so nanometers. 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 Yeah, so it's 10 to the what meters? Uh, 10 to the that, that chart's kind of smooth. Okay, uh, let me see if I can get a little bigger. Let's see, 10 to the... Yeah, minus 9? Yeah, 10 to the minus 9. Very good. 10 to the minus 9 meters. Okay, um, we got 10 to the 6th here. 10 to the 6 grams. How many... What prefix is a way to express 10 to the 6th grams? Uh, mega. Megagram. Very good. Now this one here, do we know what kinds of, what that means, that little mu L? Oh, yeah. that's, that's micro? Yeah. Micro what? Liters. Yeah, microliters. Microliters. How many liters would that be in a microliter? Uh, 10 to the 6th. Minus six. Very good. 10 to the minus 6 liters. And 10 to the ninth hertz. Hertz is a unit of cycles per second, how fast something spins or uh, recovers the, its information. 10 to the ninth is in units of what? Uh, let's see again. I'm trying. That chart's kind of small. Okay. Oh, is that a giga? Yeah. Okay. Gigahertz. Very good. <clears throat> Excellent. So hopefully and gradually we will um, learn to use these prefixes. And I think that the, the, the thing that we really want to focus on is just our, our simple ones, centimeters, millimeters, kilometers, right? Knowing how to go in between those and meters. Um, if we can do that, then I think we'll have enough information to to solve any problems that we are faced with. All right, so now let's just talk a little bit about um, different uh, um, conversion factors. Now, some of these we might have seen at one point, we might have worked or had to deal with them a lot, and so we might remember some of these conversion factors. Seen, for example, that there's uh, one inch in 2.54 centimeters, right yards per meter, miles per kilometer. But in general, I think that the average person doesn't know these. And I think that that's what Google is for nowadays. You can just ask your phone how many feet in a mile, that sort of thing. Um, if you need it, you'll be using it enough that you'll remember it. Um, so I'm less interested in students re remembering all of these values. Um, Google's where we can go and get them. What I'm more interested in is after we get them, can we do the appropriate conversions and find the, the answers we're after. So, we know that there are conversion values out there. Um, we don't need to, to memorize them. We can always go look for them. <clears throat> so, here are some common examples. Centimeter, a penny here, almost two centimeters long. Uh, the island of Oahu, 
60 kilometers by 50 kilometers, right? 60 long and 50 tall. Uh, this human hair right here is about 50 micrometers. Sometimes you'll hear micrometers called microns. Same thing, microns and micrometers. You can see on the human hair is a nanotube, a nanotube that some chemists made, tied in a little knot there, so much smaller than a human hair. Uh, and then this girl here is holding up a meter stick there, something that's one meter. Um, for volumes, common volumes, there's a three liter bottle, bottle of Coca-Cola here. Um, we're familiar probably more so with the, the liter bottle or the two liters. Uh, we talked about how one cubic centimeter or one centimeter cubed is equal to one milliliter in terms of volume. All right. Uh, to, to measure volumes in chemistry, we can use any of these really, depending on how precise we want to, to be. Uh, beakers, this bottom one, middle one here, and Erlenmeyer flasks are rarely used quantitatively. They're usually used just to, as locations to, to mix things together, um, but not qualitatively. Whereas, or sorry, not quantitatively, not, not where we care with those numbers, because those numbers are really not very accurate. Uh, if we do want to be accurate with how much volume we get, we use a graduated cylinder. That's shown here on the bottom right. Graduated means that it's labeled in terms of numbers. It's quantified, right? Um, here we have our volumetric flasks. Volumetric flasks are really going to be our tool of choice when we're making a solution because of their high accuracy. They have a, a relatively large volume below compared to the small neck where the only uh, line to, to measure your volume is. They're only good at making one volume, but they're, they're pretty precise. The error on them is, is very good. We also have a, a burette. A burette. Burettes are very long and skinny. That way, um, the volume that's delivered can be fairly accurate, right? Because any small amount that's delivered and you get a significant movement in the, the line here, the burette line. And we have what's called the meniscus. You can see a little bit how this, this yellow line here is curved a little bit. And that is, uh, kind of confusing sometimes, but what we say is we always measure the bottom of the meniscus. So if I have a graduated tube here and I have to, to measure something in it, right? And I look at this meniscus here, I always measure at the bottom of the meniscus and that will give me the, the value or the amount of material in my, my, my burette. Um, if you look at graduated cylinders, graduated cylinders have a glass base on them or a base of some sort, right? And they start down here at zero and they go up one, two, three, four, five, six, right? To whatever value, right? And so if there's nothing in it, it's zero. And as you fill it up, it goes like this, correct? However, if you look at burettes, now let's say this is a burette where we're delivering the solution out the bottom, you start at somewhere like zero, and then as you deliver, the numbers get larger as you move down. So it's telling you how much you've delivered. So sometimes you'll re be responsible for knowing, for example, looking at the numbers nine and 10 and identifying how much liquid is here in this container. And other times you're responsible for saying how much liquid, liquid has been delivered. So uh, you have to make sure you look at the numbers that it's between. And um, we'll talk more about that and get some practice. But that's a burette and graduated cylinders differ in terms of how they count, either from the top zero to 50 down for a burette or from the bottom zero up for a graduated cylinder. All right, some other common measurements for mass, right? A penny, three grams. Paperclip, less than a gram. A football player, 
100 kilograms, 100 kilograms. So um, it's, it's sometimes hard to remember. Uh, is a football player, I mean, is a, is a kilogram larger or smaller than a, a pound? And, you know, again, you can always look it up, but in general, it's a nice thing to, to remember. And if you can always remember a football player is 100 kilograms, then that kind of helps with uh, knowing the relationship between a pound and a gram, or between a pound and a kilogram. Okay, <clears throat> now let's talk a little bit about the, the uh, temperatures here. Fahrenheit and Celsius were the name of uh, glass workers, people who were good at making long, thin pieces of glass, and they found they could make a living selling thermometers better than they could just competing in the, the glass bowl market and so forth. So they were very good at making uh, thermometers, and they just chose, I mean, as the, the, the tube was filled with liquid, and the hotter the liquid, the more the liquid would expand. And so you would get uh, something that you could relate the expansion of the liquid to the temperature of your surroundings. Um, and they just made up their own systems. Celsius chose water and said that at zero degrees, that will be the freezing point of water. At 100 degrees, that will be the boiling point of water, which is nice, but it's arbitrary, right? It's helpful for an average person because you might interact with frozen water and boiling water frequently, but it's arbitrary. In other words, um, there's no reason why those values, 0 and 100, should be what they are. For Fahrenheit, uh, he was using a different chemical reaction, which is a little more complex. Um, it, was, it was fairly repeatable, though, because temperature or boiling point of water will change based on elevation. So he chose a reaction that was less sensitive to, to elevation. Um, but yeah, that's about the last thing we're going to say about Fahrenheit. Um, you can think about 212 as your boiling point, 32 as your freezing point if you want to, but really working with Celsius is all we're feeling comfortable working with Celsius is what we want to do. Notice that between 100 or 0 and 100 on Celsius, there's 100 degrees, meaning 100 ticks, marks. But from freezing to boiling point here, there's 180 degrees 180 ticks for Fahrenheit. So they're different. They're different sizes. Um, and yeah, we're never going to have to convert Fahrenheit to Celsius, um, but it's a general I thing to be aware of, the difference there. Um, Kelvin, we'll tell the story of Kelvin in a bit, but he was not, <clears throat> he was not a glass blower. He was a scientist who did a variety of things, but one of the things he did was he studied um, the volume of gases at different temperatures. Now, I don't know if you've seen this one before, but one idea is if you take your balloon that you get from the, the fair the night before, if you put it in the refrigerator, then come back the next day, the balloon will have shrunk in size. Um, and uh, I don't know if that's an effective way of preserving your balloons. I don't know if that will, it should decrease the pressure on the inside and maybe decrease how much is leaking out through the knot that's at the bottom or whatever. But um, that change in volume of the gas at different temperatures is what Kelvin was interested in studying. Okay. Uh, so again, I think we already mentioned this, but we want to reiterate that there's a hundred ticks for the difference between the freezing point of water and the boiling point of water for Kelvin. Or in other words, by the time Kelvin made these observations and created a new system, um, Celsius was the, the dominant scientific system. Therefore, the degrees stayed the same, the, the, the size of the degree, which is very helpful. Because all you have to do to convert between Celsius and Kelvin is add 273.15. So if you want to go from Celsius to degrees, or it's Kelvin, just add whatever your Celsius temperature is, 273.15. Now, this is an example of the data that Kelvin found, 
when he was comparing the volume of gas, and that's on the left side here, to the different temperatures. So here's one gas, for example, and he plotted the volume of gas as he lowered the temperature. Now there would always come a point where the gas would liquefy, right? The gas would liquefy, and then the volume would stop changing linearly. And I don't know if you've seen that one before, but if you take a balloon and stick it into liquid nitrogen, the balloon, the air inside will liquefy. And so uh, a balloon that's, you know, this big, its volume of, of water, once you take that air and convert it all to water, is very, very small. So it will shrink down to essentially what looks like an empty balloon. It will have a tiny little bit of liquid in there, but it's very small. So these are the plots of different gases versus their uh, and their volumes versus the temperature. And what he saw was that no matter what the gas is, if you keep cooling it, it gets smaller. And at some point, it extrapolates down to the same point, the same point, which was negative 273.15 degrees Celsius. And what he suggested was that, well, if the volume of the gas gets to a point where the volume of the substance is zero, then that doesn't make any sense. What would that mean, the volume of atoms to all of a sudden be zero? And definitely, it wouldn't make any sense to keep going to have a negative volume, right? That doesn't make any sense with what we understand in terms of a matter having mass, right? It would have to have some volume if there was some mass. And so what he essentially showed or predicted was that there was a, a like there's a speed limit, there's a temperature limit. You can't go colder than negative 273.15. And that's consistent with what our kind of new understanding of, of temperature is. New meaning you might not have thought about that in class before, but we showed when you take something and you freeze it, you're not changing it chemically. What you're doing is you're just taking those molecules and you're slowing them down, slowing them down. So the colder they get, the slower they get. And if we wanted to have a little competition, see who could move their hands the slowest, Right? See how good I am at it? I can go really, really slow. Right? But nobody can go slower. Right? So there's a point where there's no motion. All right? So temperature is really a measurement of the amount of kinetic energy and the amount of motion that the, a system has. Therefore, um, it makes sense that there's a point at which the, um, the temperature will stop going down because the motion has stopped. All right? So that's why Kelvin got his own system and why uh, in some scientific calculations, you have to use Kelvin to get the right answer. All right, so we're not going to talk about this, but this is our, well, we already talked about it. This is our way to convert temperature in Celsius to temperature in Kelvin. You take the temperature in Celsius, you add 273.15, and you get the temperature in Kelvin. So the Kelvin temperature at 25 degrees Celsius, take 25, add 273, and it's 298 Kelvin, 298 Kelvin. Very good. Now we're going to turn our attention to um, our uncertainties, meaning our errors, whenever a measurement is made, and show how we would um, write down a number so that people knew how much error we had in that number, okay? Um, and we kind of mentioned this previously when we were talking about the, the COVID-19 uh, uh, concerns and people having all sorts of ideas about, is this a concern? Is that aspect a concern? Should we pay more attention to this? They're making measurements and they're trying to decide, but we all know that there's lots of errors in the process, and um, we're, we're trying to wade through the data, keeping in mind that there's the errors as well. Um, the sources of errors, um, the reliability of the instrument, right? So if the, if the instrument's broken and just has an error every once in a while, then that's going to be an error. Um, 
not all instruments can measure to multiple significant or multiple decimal points, right? So if I stand on the scale and it says I weigh 180 pounds, then maybe it says 180.2 pounds, right? And then I, I pick up an apple from the, off the, the bench or whatever, but it, it might not change, right? The scale might not change. Did that mean I didn't pick up the apple or is it the apple doesn't weigh anything? No, the apple can't make an impact on, on the scale, right? So, so just because it doesn't change, it doesn't mean that there's not something there. So there's a, a, a place for error and that's a, a, the limitation of the instrument, okay? Uh, then we have ways to minimize error. We try to take a series of measurements over and over and over. Um, and we have confidence that if we do things enough, do the same experiment over and over and over, then the data will cluster around a certain, a certain value. And so we report averages. Uh, and sometimes you can also report errors. We don't report errors in this class, but we do make sure, we try to make sure at least, we use what are called uh, the appropriate number of significant figures. And we'll talk about what that means in a bit. Let's uh, talk about the difference between the terms accuracy and precision. Accuracy and precision. So um, accuracy means that your average value will be the correct value. So if I have a technique and it's an accurate technique, then that means the average value will be the correct value. But that's not enough to know that the technique is, is, is valuable. For example, uh, I can say that on average, when I hit a ball, when I go golfing, I hit it right in the hole. I can say that. On average, when I go golfing, I hit the ball right in the hole. So here's the hole, here's the green. On average, I always hit it right in the hole. Um, but that doesn't mean I'm a good golfer because I might hit it long sometimes, I might hit it short sometimes, hit it to the left, hit it to the right. In fact, I might never hit it in the hole, but on average, if you took the average location for all of these, it might be right in the hole. So the average is not necessarily a good indicator of the quality of a, of a, of a test or of an athlete for that matter, right? So um, we have to have another conversation or another word for us, which is precision, precision. If I'm accurate, I have a good average, but if I'm precise, then my cluster around the average is, is very small or what we call the, the standard deviation. So there's one cluster of shots. Here's the same green. And now this time I'm hitting the ball in a very small cluster. The average is still here, so I can say I'm accurate, but I can also say I am more precise. I am more precise because all my shots are relatively close in terms of distance to the hole. Does that make sense, Walt? Yeah. Okay. So um, I always have a hard time remembering the difference between accurate and precise. So what I do is uh, precise sounds like pretty. And if it's clustered nice and tight around the area, it looks prettier than if it's all spread out. So that's the, my method for remembering the difference between accuracy and precision. All right, so let's talk about um, one of the things that we just mentioned, um, the limitations on an instrument to, to tell us um, how much of a material or to make a measurement for us. So, for example, if I was on hard times and I went to a shop and I was going to sell my ring. 
All right. I go there. They put the ring on the scale. And this is what the scale reads. And the clerk says, well, I can pay you for uh, 21, 21 units. So here's a 20, 21, 22, or no, 20, 22, 4, 6, no, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. So 21. What would you say? That, what, what well, 21 grams, let's say. All grams, okay. 21 grams. Is that a good value there, or does it look like it's a little bit higher than 21 grams? Oh, I see. Yeah. The, the, there we go. Can you see it a yeah, little bit there? It's a little bit higher. It's a little bit higher. Yeah. And you could argue, no, 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 it's not 21. It's 21 point... Can you tell? What do you think? What do you think it might be? Give me an estimate. Uh, 0.3. Okay, 21.3, fair estimate. 21.2 also might be a fair estimate. It's probably not 21.1, and it's probably not 21.4, but we really can't tell. So what we do when we're making measurements, we know for sure it's 21 point something, and so what we do is we say the answer here, the number that we can report so that we don't confuse people about how much we actually have, is we can say I have 21 for sure, and then the next number, 0.3. And that last number is always an estimate. It's always an estimate, okay? So by writing that down, I'm telling somebody that I have two accurate numbers and then one that is an estimate. All right? So no more of this, you know, if I have a calculator here and I put in some, some question, 15.8 divided by 9.5, I have a value 1.663157895. I can't write down all those values because I don't have that much um, confidence in all of these values. I only had confidence in three numbers here and two numbers there. So my number has to be limited by those measurements. I can't just all of a sudden say I'm this confident. Okay? So we'll talk about that in a bit and how many numbers you can, you can measure. But... If you didn't like the offer, you could go to a different place and then uh, try to see if they would give you any more. I don't know if you can see. I don't know if I can get it in much bigger there. Can you see the new measurement? Okay. What does it look like? So, uh, oh. Too small? Yeah, it's still a little small. Well, it's about... Oh, I, I, oh wait, I see what we're doing. Um, yeah, could you count the, the numbers from... Yeah, uh, so from 21 to 22, each yeah. one is right. a, a, a tick. 21.1, 21.2, 21.3, a tenth, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we see it's definitely yeah. what? Can you see that? 21.3. Yeah, it's definitely 21.3. And now our estimate would be slightly higher. So maybe 21.31, oh, 21.32, not 21.35. Yeah. But, you know, you couldn't fault somebody if they said that because they get to have one estimate on there. So now our estimate has changed from 21.3 to maybe 21.31 or 21.32, something like that. So the number of digits that you can report is related to the sensitivity of your machine. Okay. Now, sometimes you have what are called exact numbers, exact numbers. So, for example, if I have uh, 
12 eggs, um, there's no doubt how many eggs I have. I have 12. If it's a dozen, it's a dozen. So I, I don't have to say, well, you might have 12.1, or you might have 12.2, or you might have 11.95. When I have an exact number of something, then I don't have to limit my other calculations based on that, uh, that measurement, because it's an exact number. And this really comes into play when we use conversions. Conversions. So for example, one meter has 100 centimeters. But I could also write 100.0 or 100.00 or 0 .0000. It has as many zeros as I want. So this one and that 100, because it's just a conversion, is not going to be limiting my number of significant digits later on in my calculations. And we'll talk more about significant digits here now. Uh, let's go through a couple of problems here. Can you see this one first? Which one will be a reasonable answer for this, the volume of material in this container? Can you bring me the ball, Mom? Yeah, thanks for that. Sure. What do we got here? Uh, I would say C. Okay, 7.35. Very good. Very good. Excellent. And we couldn't do 7.4 because it's not there. We measured at the bottom of the meniscus. Excellent job. Very good. Okay. Now, uh, let's see if we can do this one here. Is it the same answer, or is there something different? No, oh, I see. Uh, yeah, it's different. So it, it'll be, uh, looks like it's A. A? Or maybe C. C. Which one, A or C? Yeah, go. Uh, so we go with the numbers that we know, and then we have to put in one A. guess, right? Yeah, right. I'll, I'll say C. Yeah, because 6, 6.1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 for sure. And now is it 6.61, 6.62, 6.63? All those would probably be reasonable guesses, but it's definitely more than 6.6. .6. So from this, from this sort of a device, you should be able to have three uh, significant digits. We call those three significant digits. So again, the device governs how many significant digits you should be able to get. So, if somebody just gives us a number, I mean, now we're, we kind of know a little bit about how to look at devices, look at measuring devices, and uh, identify the number of values that we should be able to get out of it, but we also need to be able to look at a number and just know how many significant figures there are. And so I'm going to introduce to you a set of rules about how when, when you look at a number, you can say, aha, that number has this many significant digits. Um, and the first rule is that if it's not a zero, then it has to be a significant digit. If they're not zero numbers, that means there's some way that that device could make a measurement or at least a single one of those numbers is going to be an estimate. But if they're not zeros, then they're definitely significant and uh, they're either actual numbers or one estimate. If we're looking at zeros that are between significant digits, then those zeros are significant. Those zeros were not there just because um, uh, we wanted to put some numbers there, right? There was a way the device had the ability to measure it, and it put zeros in there. So the placeholders could have been filled if there was anything there, but there wasn't. So those are significant digits also. Um, zeros to the right of a non-zero digit, so like 2,000, are only significant if there is a decimal point at the end. And we can use the decimal point as a tool 
to help uh, us indicate to others how many significant digits there are. So 2,000 with a decimal point has four significant figures. 50 with a decimal point has two significant figures. Okay, zeros to the left of non-zero digits are not significant, are not significant. Those are just there because they're holding a, a place. So let's say, for example, I had 0.0002 uh, millimeters. 0 0.0002 millimeters. Let me write this down really quick. If I had 0 0.002 millimeters, 0 0.002 millimeters and I wanted to write this in terms of meters not millimeters but meters all right uh, oh no 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 sorry other way around if I had 0 0.002 meters let's try that again if I had 0 0.002 meters whoops too many zeros but that's okay where's it at there it is if I have 0 0.0002 meters, and I wanted to write that in terms of millimeters, how many millimeters would that be? How many decimal places do I go from meters to millimeters? I go three, is that right? That's right. So I have oh, to I go, so point. yeah, one, two, three. So 0 0.2 meters, or millimeters. The number is the same. 0 0.0002 meters is the same as 0.2 millimeters. I mean, the, the value is the same. It's the same amount. And I made it on, measured it on some device. So the number of significant figures here can't be different than the number of significant figures there. So I can't say just simply by calling it meters that I have more significant digits. So zeros that are before here are not significant. This value still only has one significant figure, just like that one has one significant figure. All right? So zeros in front are not significant. Zeros at the end of a number, again, without a decimal, are also not significant. Okay? So if we want to show somebody that they are significant, we either have to put a decimal point or we have to write it a different way. So, for example, if I wanted to show that all of these numbers were significant, I could say, put a decimal point there, 30. Then that says that I have one, two, three significant digits. That's what that decimal point is telling me. If maybe only two of the numbers were significant, how would I write it if only two of the numbers were significant and this was a, a, a um, just a placeholder? Well, well, that would be a that would be a different number, right? I have three hundred, but I only want two significant digits. We would use scientific notation, so we would say three point zero times ten to the one. Oh no, times ten to the two. Sorry times 10 to the 2. And what that would do is it would move the decimal place over 2. So this value equals 300, but it's showing me here that there's only two significant digits. All right? So I have ways using scientific notation to express some of the zeros as significant, but not others. All right? So for example, let's have you answer this one now. I have this number. 20,000. How many people were at the fair last night? Well, we had people counting. They counted this many. We added them all up, and we said 20,000. Exactly 20,000 people? Well, there's some error. Well, how many people, I mean, what's our error, right? How many significant digits are there in that 20,000? How would we express this if we wanted to say we had three significant digits? How would we express it in scientific notation if we wanted to say we had three significant digits? What do you think? So, 20 to the uh, third? 
Okay, you can do 20 Five times months. 10 to the third. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Now, one more thing I want to, I forgot to tell you about scientific notation is in scientific notation, this number here is always a number between one and 10. So it allows us just to have the smallest brain as possible. Just think about numbers between one and 10 and then put this unit on to say how the decimal point needs to change. So if we wanted to uh -huh. do it with a number between one and 10, what number would we choose? Two. Uh, two. two. And then we would put point. And then, right. then what? If and we then, uh, if we said we wanted three significant digits. Okay. So ten. Two point oh, two point zero zero zero. Zero zero, just zero zero, right? That would give us our three significant digits. Oh, that's our three. Okay, I see. And now we have to go ten to the what to make sure everybody knows that this is really twenty thousand. One, two, three, four, right? Because oh, one, okay. two, three, four, 10 to the fourth. So 20,000 where we're saying this is our estimated value, all right? So it okay. could be up and down maybe one or two or three digits. So either, so it kind of gives us a range. So essentially when somebody says, this is how many people were at the fair, they're saying that there was probably 23,000, uh, or maybe it was down to uh, 19,700. So somewhere between, whoops, one extra zero there. 19,700 and 20,300, because they said that was their, their estimate. So the estimate was somewhere in between there, right? Okay. Does that make sense? You follow that okay? Yeah. So the number of significant yeah. digits help us know helps us know what the estimate. We really don't know if it was 197, 198, 199, 20 to 1, but we just know that was the one that they said they they estimated on. Okay. Good. So let's see if we can look at these numbers that people will give us and we'll see if we can predict how many significant digits there are. What do you think? How many significant digits are there in this value here? Said, uh, Want to look back at the rules here? Or are those yeah, too small to read? Yeah. Non-zero. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so they're all significant. That's right. Three significant digits. Very good. How about this one here? Uh, just the three. Just the five zero zero? Oh, oh wait, wait. Said that they're uh, non-zero, so just just one. Well, with the decimal point there, right? Yeah, that's. It's right. telling us that those are significant, and then after the decimal point, if there's a zero, that means that that was their estimate. So that has to okay. be all four. All four are significant digits. Nice. Can you see that? Yes. Okay. How about this one here? And that's, that would be all, all four. Well, this one doesn't have a, 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 a decimal place, oh, does it? No decimal point, so then it's just one. Yeah, that's right. Just one. No decimal point. If somebody writes a thousand, we have no way of knowing whether there's more than one significant digit. That's kind of like saying there's seven billion people in the world. Okay. There's not exactly 7 billion, we know that. It's changing every single second. Uh, how much do we really know? Uh, if the seven is the estimate, then it could be between six and eight, right? Um, that's not what people generally, who actually report these values know, they know more than that one significant digit. But um, the number of significant digits that they report helps us know how accurate their 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 um, reporting is okay. What do you think about this one? Uh, two. Okay. Is this zero in front significant? Do you think? Uh, well, it's a oh, I see. It's a placeholder. 
That's right. So that one's not significant. The five is significant, right? Yes. Why did they put two more zeros over here? To show that there's uh, nothing after. Well, to also show that they had some way to measure it and there was nothing there. So yeah. this five is significant and both of these zeros after are significant. Um, there was a way for them to measure something. They put down zero and zero. So that means there's three significant digits there. Okay? Don't worry about these too much. Um, it's something that will kind of grow on us over time. So if you had trouble with these, I wouldn't be terribly con concerned about that. Um, there will every once in a while be questions about um, how to add significant figures together. And uh, we'll, we'll talk about those, how to add and, and multiply and divide. But um, it's something that we don't have to be perfect on to move forward. Okay, uh, maybe a couple, and then we'll be finished for the day. How about this number? Any ideas? Tricky little number here. Yeah. Um, six. Um, I'm going to say none of the none of these. Well, why is this zero in front here? Does that have anything to do with it? Well, that is tricky, yeah. No. <laughs> so it's just the five, right? Just the five of those right. numbers. Okay, very good. Well, the next time we meet, we'll talk about how to identify how many significant digits you should keep once you've done, performed uh, specific kinds of calculations. But otherwise, that's a good place to stop. Good job.